Greetings and blessings to all. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Change of Raymond. I'm very excited to be here, and I pray that you are just as excited to be here as I am. I truly hope that you are having a blessed and victorious day in Christ. And although some of us may have faced trials today, I pray that your trials will become triumphs and that your tests will become testimonies. That's my prayer for you, my prayer for myself and all of the brothers and sisters around the world. So we have much to cover tonight. So we are going to delve right into our topic. As you can see from the title, we are dealing with dress reform is health reform. Now, this is going to be a mini series, a two part mini series within the larger series of change of raiment. And so we're going to be dealing with today specifically covering the extremities. And then next week, we're going to deal with, by God's grace, deal with another aspect of dress reform from a health perspective. So a lot of us, when we consider dress reform, we look at it solely from the perspectives of modesty, dressing for modesty, right? We look at it from the perspective of simplicity. We look at it also from the standpoint of distinction in the sexes, what we looked at last in our previous session. And we also look at, look at it from uh, the perspective of distinction from the world. And of course, we should look at dress reform from all of these perspectives. As a matter of fact, all of the previous lessons that we've been looking at dress reform have been dealing with those various topics. But there's one perspective that many of us fail to look at this topic of dress reform from, and that's the perspective of health reform. A lot of us are health reformers, and we know the eight laws of health, and we, uh, we meticulously follow those eight laws of health. So we guard what we put in our bodies, we guard our rest, some of us. <laughs> some of us still need to work on that aspect of, of health reform, right? We make sure we get adequate sunlight, we make sure we get enough water, we make sure we exercise every day. These things are excellent. But do you know that we not only need to guard what we put in our bodies, but also what we put on our bodies, not just on our skin, but even our clothing. And so tonight and next week, by God's grace, we are going to be talking about the importance of dress reform from a health perspective. And again, we're dealing with covering the extremities. So, of course, we know that we are not our own. Our bodies are God's temple, right? And so we need to be very, very careful, just as meticulously as we would guard our diet and other aspects of health reform. We need to be just as conscientious when it comes to our dressing. And many of us don't realize that. And so we're dressing out of harmony with health principles and out of harmony with God's principles unknowingly. But by God's grace today, the light is going to shine brighter as to why the Lord tells us we are to cover our upper and lower extremities just as thoroughly as we cover the rest of our bodies, our chest, stomach, areas, backs, etc. All right, so we're going to get right into this at this time. Let's look at this first slide here. And this says dress reform proper provided for the protection and development of every part of the body. It doesn't say some parts of the body. It doesn't say just the development of the skin. It says every part of the body. Now, let me ask you this. Are your lungs a part of your body? Yes. What about your kidneys? What about your heart? Right? So every part of the body, not just the skin, but also our, our internal organs are impacted by the way we dress. So we need to be following dress reform proper, right? The proper way to follow dress reform so that our bodies can develop in the way that they're supposed to develop and so that we can be in good health not only spiritually, but also physically, because our physical health does indeed impact our spiritual health. Let's go to the next slide here. And this is a very startling slide. And it says fashion is a tyrannical mistress. And many of us know this to be true. Fashion rules the world and she is a tyrannical mistress, often compelling her devotees to submit to the greatest inconvenience and discomfort. Fashion taxes without reason and collects without mercy. She has a fascinating power and stands ready to criticize and ridicule all who do not follow in her wake. How many of you know this statement to be true? 
I want to highlight the part that says that often the devotees to fashion, they submit to the greatest inconvenience and discomfort. Is this not true? And ladies, I want to pick on us here for a second. Think about your hair. Sometime to get your hair fashioned or styled in a certain way, you go through the most excruciating pain. And not only pain, but you spend time, a lot of time. You make a lot of sacrifices for a hairstyle. Also, many people put themselves through extreme discomfort for a certain style. So they wear tight girdles and tight clothing. And that's what we're going to, I'm just kind of tipping my hand. That's what we're going to be dealing with next week, the tight clothing. But they put themselves through this pain. They can hardly breathe, can hardly walk, put themselves through excruciating pain just to fit on a tight skirt or tight skinny jeans, right? Can't even button it up without going through all sorts of gymnastics, laying down on the bed or doing whatever you have to do just to get your leg into, into whatever you're trying to put on. So you put yourself through this pain and discomfort and you're destroying your health, you're destroying your organs all because you're a slave to fashion. May God set us free and deliver us from the bondage that fashion has upon us, right? And yet some of us that are devoted, some of those that are devoted to fashion, I don't wanna say some of us, some of those that are devoted to fashion, when it comes to self-denial for the gospel's sake, they're not willing to go through any inconvenience, any privation, any loss, any sacrifice, but yet to achieve a certain look for vanity's sake, for fashion's sake, you would put yourselves, even in the hospital, you would put yourselves through pain, discomfort, yea, even torture. Let's move on. I digress here. So we are going to go back to the account of Adam and Eve. And you're probably saying, well, we, every lesson we always go back to Adam and Eve. Well, the Bible says in Isaiah 46, 9 and, two, 9 and 10, rather, that we are supposed to remember. God tells us to remember the former things, right? And God says that he declares the end from the beginning. So if we want to know how to live, how to dress right now, even in these last days, we need to go to the beginning. So we're going to go back to the beginning. Just a quick recapitulation. I know we know it, but repetition does what? It deepens the impression. So of course, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and sinned, they lost their covering of light. They were naked in God's sight. What did they do? They tried to cover their nakedness by sewing together fig leaves and they made aprons out of those fig leaves. That did not cover them. They were still naked. They were immodest, right? So what did God have to provide for them? God gave them a change of raiment. He gave them dress reform. So he made for them coats of skin, right? That covered the entire body, right? Covered the upper extremities, the lower extremities, Everything that was left open by the apron, which we showed in previous lessons, the chest, the back, the buttocks, the thighs, etc., all of that was covered. The arms, all of that was covered with the coats of skin. So not only did God do that to cover their nakedness so they could be modest, God also had to do it so that they could be in good health. And we're going to see that from these next two statements, right? Because God wanted them to be not only spiritually clothed, he wanted them to also be physically clothed and also healthy. So let's look at this statement. It says here, after their sin, Adam and Eve were no longer to dwell in Eden. They earnestly entreated that they might remain in the home of their innocence and joy. They confessed that they had forfeited all right to the happy abode, to that happy abode, but pledged themselves for the future to yield strict obedience to God. But they were told that their nature had become, become depraved by sin. They had lessened their strength to resist evil and had opened the way for Satan to gain more ready access to them. In their innocence, they had yielded to temptation. And now in a state of conscious guilt, they would have less power to maintain their integrity. In humility and unutterable sadness, they bade farewell to the beautiful home and went forth to dwell upon the earth where rested the curse of sin. Now hone in on this part here. The atmosphere, once so mild and uniform in temperature, was now subject to marked changes and the Lord mercifully provided them with a garment of skins as a protection from what? Only from the cold, right? 
it says as a protection from the extremes of heat and cold. So we see right here that these coats of skin were to protect them, were to keep them in good physical health. Protect them from what? The extremes of the heat. So does that mean we have to cover our extremities, upper and lower, in the summertime? It's clear. And also from the extremes of cold. Let's read this second statement, which is akin to it. And this one comes from the story of redemption. First one, patriarchs and prophets. Let's go on to the yellow part here. It says the atmosphere was changed. It was no longer unvarying as before the transgression. God clothed them with coats of skins to protect them from the sense of chilliness and then of heat to which they were exposed. That's crystal clear. And a lot of people will scoff at this and say, well, uh, you don't know how it is to live <clears throat> in the Caribbean or near the equator where it gets in the hundred, you know, the triple digits, right? It's very hot. So we have to wear short sleeves and short things to keep cool. No, the, our clothing, the clothing of the extremities actually protects us from the heat, as we're going to see later. It shades us from the heat, right? Okay, so we're going to um, go on here. So yes, the extremities have to be clothed even in the summer. So what does that rule out? Now, we dealt with this at length in our previous session, so I'm not going to take the time to go too deep. So that rules out the strapless. Of course, that's immodest anyway, right? But it's also unhealthful. The sleeveless, the spaghetti straps, the short sleeves, right? The short pants for male or female, women, the short mini skirts. It rules all of that out. The extremities must be clothed in all seasons, summer, winter, fall, spring, right? It ha we have to be clothed. All right, so now we're going to look at a few statements that will show us exactly why. Why is it so important for our bodies to be evenly clothed, extremities included? So let's go to the screen again. We're told in Healthful Living that perfect health depends upon perfect circulation of the blood. The more active the circulation, the more free from obstructions and impurities will be the blood. The blood nourishes the body. The health of the body depends upon the healthful circulation of the blood. And many of us will say, amen, amen. That's why it's so important for us to do hot and cold to get the circulation flowing in our body. Yes, that helps the circulation. Yes, there it is. We need to exercise every day to get the circulation flowing freely throughout our body. Amen, we do. We also need to cover the extremities so that the, the blood can circulate throughout the body as it is supposed to, so that our organs and every part of our body can be developed in the way that God wants it to be and function the way it is supposed to. So let's look at the whys. And this statement is very sad. It says, in order to follow the fashions, mothers dress their children with limbs nearly naked. And it's not nearly naked. If you look at the picture today, that's all, the limbs are all the way naked. We've all seen parents allow their child to run around and the only thing the child has on is a diaper, even in public, right? Very common practice. It says in the blood, what happens to the blood? Is the blood circulating properly? No, the blood is chilled back from its natural course and it's thrown upon the internal organs, breaking up the circulation and producing disease. So a lot of times, a child may be sick and the parents just don't know why. My child keeps getting sick, keeps getting this ailment and that ailment, and we just don't know what it is. We, you know, we've checked the diet. We've checked if he's, you know, allergic to anything. We don't know what it is. Could it be that they're leaving the limbs of their child exposed and therefore disease is the result? Let's, let's continue on with this slide here. It says the limbs, look at this part. The limbs were not formed by our creator to endure exposure as was the face, right? So we don't have to walk around covering our faces, right? But we should be covering the limbs. The Lord provided also large veins and nerves for the limbs and feet to contain a large amount of the current of human life that the limbs might be uniformly as warm as the body. So are our chest naked? Are we walking around with no shirts on? Are our backs open? I, I certainly hope not, right? So why are not our arms and our legs, our limbs clothed just as adequately? It says here, they should be so thoroughly clothed as to induce the blood to the extremities. So what happens when we don't clothe the extremities, 
the blood does not circulate to those areas of the body. Hence, we have cold hands all the time, cold feet. Maybe our hands and our feet are numb. And then again, that blood that was supposed to circulate to the extremities, that the feet and the hands and so forth, the legs, it's thrown back on the internal or organs causing congestion. And we're going to see this in the next slide here. All right. Well, we'll see it in a future slide. This is another slide. And again, we know that Satan was the one that inspired Adam and Eve to make those fig leaf garments that left the body exposed. And Satan is still at work today. It says here, Satan invented the fashions which leave the limbs exposed, chilling back the life current from its original course. And parents bow at the shrine of fashion. That goes back to our previous statement. People being slaves to fashion. Parents are bowing at the shrine of fashion and so clothe their children and themselves, I would add, that the nerves and veins become contracted and do not answer the purpose that God designed they should. The result is habitually cold feet and hands. How many of you can attest to this? Before you came into the grand divine truth of dress reform, how many of you can say that your hands and your feet were cold all the time? You were always cold. Well, why is that? because they were exposed, they were not clothed. Of course, you're gonna be cold if they're just left out in the elements like that. And the blood is not there circulating. Let's continue on in that slide. It says here, those parents who follow fashion instead of reason will have an account to render to God for thus robbing their children of health. So we see that dress reform is important also for children. Now, there will be some individuals that will scoff at this and say, OK, so the previous two quotes, I've seen um, children being emphasized, babies and children being emphasized. It doesn't say anything about when we grow up and when we get older that we have to cover our extremities. It's just for us when we're in those early years of life. No, it goes from <laughs> from when we're born all the way throughout life. OK, and we're going to see that here. In this statement. It says when the limbs and arms are chilled, look what happens. The blood is driven from these parts to the lungs and head. The circulation is impeded and nature's fine machinery does not move harmoniously. Does this say just for babies and children? That just goes across the board. So what happens there? What's the result of when the uh, limbs and arms are not clothed? It says what happens to the lungs and the head? Right. It's it could, causing congestion. The circulation is impeded. And we read earlier that perfect health depends on what? It depends on perfect circulation of the blood. So if your blood is not circulating properly throughout the system, I don't care what your diet is. You may have the cleanest diet. You may exercise every day. But if you are not clothing yourself in relation to health, you're not going to be in perfect health. And if you're not in good health physically, it's going to affect you in every other area. It's going to affect you mentally. D didn't it talk about how the head was affected? So you're not going to be able to think clearly to discern God's word, right? Your lungs are also affected. So you're not going to be able to breathe properly, right? Isn't fresh air one of the eight laws of health? So there's no way we can be in perfect health if we're dressing out of harmony with health principles. OK, I think we finished up with that quote here. Right. So nature's fine machinery is broken down when we fail to dress according to uh, the principles laid out here. What about the feet now? This says the most of us wear clothing enough, but many fail to give every part of the body its due proportion. So we need to be proportionately clothed right throughout our body with exception to our face and hands. Right. If any part of the body should be favored with extra covering, it should be what? The limbs and the feet, extra covering, which are at a distance from the great wheel of life, which sends the blood through the system. And that's talking about the heart, which pumps out the blood to the system. The limbs should ever be clothed with a warm covering to protect them from a chill current of air. If the feet are clothed with good sized, thick soled, warm boots or shoes, for comfort rather than for, what's that word again? Fashion. The blood will be induced to circulate freely in the limbs and feet, as well as other portions of the body. If we give the lungs and what? 
feet, ample room to do the work God designed they should, we shall be rewarded with better health and a clearer conscience. That's clear. That is clear. Now, when we talk about dress reform and covering the extremities, of course, we have to know how to dress appropriately for different seasons of the year, right? We, in the winter time, which we're, well, we're not quite in the winter, but it's cold in most places of this country, at least. Um, in the winter time, we're going to layer up, of course. We would not go outside with no jacket on, right, or a coat. We would not go outside without a scarf, right, or even something over our head to, to protect us from the cold. In the summertime, we wouldn't have to layer up. But at the same time, in the summertime, do the extremities still need to be clothed? Yes, they do. Right? They still need to be clothed to protect us from the sun, right? From the, from the extremes of the heat. And all of us can attest that each winter that comes and each summer that comes, the extremes are getting more extreme. They're getting more, the heat is getting more intense and the cold in the winter time is getting more intense. So we need to be adequately clothed. And let me just say this on this point. We talked about um, the distinction of dress in last week's uh, segment. And we talked about how that uh, in the cold, of course, that women's legs have to be covered as well. So we said that she is to make sure her extremities are clothed. You're not supposed to just wear a thin layer of a dress and then your legs are just out or just bare under the under the dress or skirt. You are to put a warm uh, pants, a warm legging, a warm stocking, long johns, whatever you want to call it, under your long skirt, right? To keep your extremities um, clad, clothed, right? For modesty and also for health. So I just wanted to throw that in in case uh, you all were wondering about that. All right. Now, I want to ask you all a question and think about it. When you see landscapers, people out mowing the lawn in the summertime, it may be 95 degrees, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Very hot. What are they wearing? You see them with, are they shirtless? Do they have on shorts? No, they have on big hats. They have on long sleeves and they have on long pants. The males, right? Why? Why do you think they're dressed this way? To protect them from the extremes of the heat. And also to protect them from debris. Yes, we know that, but it's also to protect, it keeps them cooler. Because think about it. If your skin is directly exposed to the sun, it's going to burn. That sun is hot. That's why people get sunburn. In the sun, if people are out in the sun, what do they do? Even though many of them are naked, they're not clothed properly, but you'll see them with an umbrella if they're out at the park or wherever. Why? Because they're protecting themselves from the sun. So why not allow your clothing in the summertime, even in the tropical, humid climate, to protect you from the sun? Now, material also must be taken into consideration as well. You're not going to wear the thick sweater, um, heavy material in the summer. The same materials you would wear in the wintertime, you would not wear in the summertime. So the light material, you want to wear natural materials, which are breathable, which absorb the sweat, right? Um, your linen are, materials are good for the heat. Also, your cotton, your merino wool as well are good materials that you can wear, thin materials, even the bamboo that we learned about with um, Sister Keisho as well, right? These are good, light materials that you can wear. Now, my siblings and I, we have a running joke with my dad because coming up, and my dad is a handyman. He would do things outside, inside, anything that needs fixing up, he is able to do that. You know, but we, as, even as adults, I can think of one time that I've seen my dad's legs. I've never, we, and we laugh about it. And we, as children, we didn't understand. Even when he's outside uh, pushing that push mower, sweating profusely, and he loved to jog as well. So when he's going out jogging, he's wearing long pads, jean pads, and we would laugh at him for that as well, and long sleeves, and he would come back just dripping with sweat, and we would ask him, Dad, well, why, why are you wearing these heavy clothes? Why are you dressing in long sleeves? Wouldn't you be cooler? But he understood what we're teaching tonight, that that kept him cooler. And you know what happens when you sweat, when you're wearing the right type of materials, when you sweat in the long sleeves, and that sweat kind of evaporates, it actually... Uh, cools you down as well. Whereas if you just leave your skin exposed to the, the sun, 
it's not going to cool you down. It's going to take all the moisture out and it's just going to burn your skin, right? Even roofers and other people of various other professions, you never see them uh, with their extremities out when they're doing their work because it keeps them cooler. Even people in desert-like climates, they're, they're clothed, right? And you don't find them falling out uh, from heat stroke, right? All right, so let's move on. I think we made the point there, and I think you, you all can attest to that fact as well. Look at this startling st statistic here on the screen. It says there is but one woman in a thousand. Now you do the math. Is that more, is that 1% or more, or is that less than 1%? I won't answer the question. You do the math. There is but one woman in a thousand who clothes her limbs as she should. Are we one of those <laughs> for the women? And I wonder what the statistic would be for the men. How many of the men are clothing their extremities, their limbs, right? Not one in a thousand. That's sad. And I hope among those that profess to believe present truth that we are covering our limbs. Now, on the point of women, let's go to the virtuous woman. Right. Because she was also a dress reformer and she made sure to provide adequate garments for her household and for also the poor and the needy. In Proverbs 31, verse 21, it says here that the virtuous woman, she is not afraid of the snow. Why? For her household. For all her household are clothed with scarlet. They're all clothed adequately for the season. So I think we made the point there. And um People may find hooks to hang their doubt upon, but the word of God is clear. We see it from the beginning and we see it even um, even people in the world will tell you why it's important. And I think we've already addressed the vitamin D issue. Right. And so I'm not going to go there. You can get enough vitamin D being uh, being clothed the way God has you to be clothed. OK, so you can absorb the correct amount of vitamin D3 through your face and also through your hands, okay? You don't have to expose your back, your chest. And if you feel that you're deficient in vitamin D, for you have a, a situation, a health situation, then you may need to look into a plant-based supplement for that. But that's another topic altogether. So we are going to actually close, close there. Um, what more can be said? So we are going to come back next week and deal with another aspect of dress reform, from the perspective of health reform, I already gave it away. I like to surprise you guys, but since I gave it away, we are going to be dealing with something that has become very ubiquitous and it's very deleterious to the health, and that's tight garments. Many people are suffocating themselves, their organs, their, their veins, their blood vessels through these tight garments, and I pray that we will not be found among those devotees to fashion. So thank you. The time goes by so fast here. I pray that you all were blessed tonight, and I pray that the rest of your day and the rest of your week will be a blessed one. Take care until next time. God bless.